Hello everyone, we're very excited to show you gameplay of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 today. I'm Josh, the community manager for the Chinese Room. Hi, I'm Alex, I'm project creative director on Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. Bloodlines 2 is a first person action RPG where you get to embody a elder vampire called Fire. Could you tell us what clan we're going to be playing as today? Yeah, so today we're going to be playing as Bruja and they have supernatural speed and strength, uh, but they're also known to sometimes uh, lose their temper. So when we go through the dialogue trees, we'll be picking the more aggressive and intimidating options. Great, and could you tell us the context for the mission that we're about to see? Yes, yeah, so it's one of the early missions where Far is now established in Seattle. She's made inroads with the court and she's investigating the mark on her hand, which has been uh, holding back her powers. And she's got a tip off that a vampire called Willem, a Nosferatu, might have the answers. Uh, so we're gonna show you from where she's tracked him down to his warehouse and is about to confront him. Great, without further ado, let's take a look. I do not like this. All those marked freaks were waiting outside. And yet none appear to have entered. Why track Willem to this place and then refrain from attack? How does anyone find anything in a mess like this? Perhaps to him this is an orderly chaos. Nosferatu trade in secrets. This is merely another way to hide them. I recognize this song from before I slept. Yeah, it's old school for sure. We may be nearing the end of our search. That must be him. Before I could even finish the song, how cruel. Am I interrupting? It's you. The Nomad. Willem, I take it. You had some interesting guests outside. Expecting trouble? That depends. Why, why, why are you here? Tolly tells me you keep the court's secrets and its histories. Earlier tonight, another kindred by the name of Isabella used this mark to sap my power. Do you know anything about it? No, 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 no. All I had to do was keep my head down for just a few more nights. He's hiding something. Tell me, Willem, what rumors have you heard about me? That you were there in Cairo. They, they called you the Slayer. I have been many things to many people. And what will I be to you, Willem? And to this lonely, forgotten warehouse? You're exactly what he said you'd be. I guess that makes it easier. Makes what easier? What happens next? Now I have to do what he told me. Do what he told me? Willem knows something. We have to find him. He made the mark bleed. He knows how to use it against me. Hodge can't just teleport people. That's not normal. An illusion. 
illusion. At least we know he is here. Somewhere.
got a situation. Yeah. The nomad of all legs. Yeah, she's not waking up. I made sure of that. Everything will last me. Just a few more nights, right? Like you said. Okay. I wish I could. We can't just stay here, right? How do we get out? Hush. There she I cannot hear myself think. He is using everything he has to hold on. Under I. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Talk him down, fire. Fast. Disarm this bomb as your elder. I command it. I, I can't. You gotta understand. Unless you would rather I ripped it from your skeleton and your flesh with it. Please, please. It's not up to me. They said I could see my family again. The memories. They said, if, if I cut off the court, if I took away their little black book, all their secrets, it would cause the chaos he needed to strike, and, and I'd be free. Who is this he? The Malkavian. The gardener. The gardener. But now you got the truth. You know what that means, right? Fire, you're losing him. Listen to me, you useless, spineless, molten tumor. This gardener sold you a lie. Your family will not want to see you. If they even still live. Jeez, fire. You are not the man they knew. To them you are a monster. Find some other dream to cling to. But do not destroy yourself for another's game. You don't understand. They're listening. 
was on the call the whole time. Willem. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Thank you for watching, we're back, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so I'm going to do a Q&A with Alex to talk about what you just saw. So, could you explain the gameplay that we just saw? I mean, it's, it's early enough in the game that there isn't too many spoilers in it, uh, which was definitely good, but it also showed a good variety of the different gameplay. We started with some exploration, which, you know, allows everyone to sort of soak in the atmosphere. Then we have uh, some stalking in there. Um, which moved to brawling, as it will, with the Bruja. Maybe if we'd been Banu Hakim, we would have taken that whole warehouse out uh, using stealth. And then moving, um, as you say, it starts to get a bit trippier. Uh, there are visions, there's influence of, of a Malkavian vampire um, in there, through, working through uh, Willem. So we move more to what we call our vampire detective gameplay, so non-combat gameplay, very exploration, about you having to juice, look for clues to solve uh, ultimately the, the puzzle and escape Willem's trap. So zooming out, can you tell us about where our story in Seattle starts? Yeah, it starts with uh, you wake up in a derelict apartment building covered in blood, having been essentially in vampire hibernation for a hundred years. So you wake up with questions. Um, <laughs> And soon as you move through that warehouse, um, it becomes apparent you're not alone. Uh, Fire has a voice in her head, Fabian. Fabian is another vampire. At this stage, I can't explain why their voice is in Fire's head, but it's very much to do with the markings that are all over her body. When she went into hibernation, she was in the Middle East. And she's woken up 100 years later in America and clearly someone's been messing with her while she's asleep so she's got questions and she's quite annoyed that sort of is our initial drive is trying to figure out what happened to her and how to undo it and how to get this voice out of my head because fire enjoys her solitary time she does not want to share her head with another vampire we've had to translate a tabletop pen and paper game into action and a big part of what a vampire is is a bloodsucker so we really wanted to focus on feeding. Could you tell us about how feeding works in combat specifically? Sure. Um, I mean, there's, there's two kinds of feeding across the game in general. There's combat feeding and social feeding. I think we'll talk about social feeding on a later video. But yes, combat feeding you're using within a combat encounter like this for two reasons. One, it's the main way to get health. So if you're you know, getting beat, beaten up too many strikes against you, then you probably need to retreat and go and feed on someone weaker in the encounter, uh, but also to power your abilities. Feeding is essentially a reward for stalking or brawling successfully. You get an enemy to low health, there's a window where you can feed on them, uh, so try not to hit them again or they'll die. Um, and if you can embrace that, you'll get one of the blood pips for each of your abilities, so these are little pips below each abilities will fill. If you can fill all of the pips for an ability, then you can use it and rinse repeat because that will then allow you to do more feeds which allow you to charge them again. And if played, if played really well, the abilities synergize together and allow you to do chains. And the brew heart is designed around that sort of staying in the fight, chaining uh, fight to fight to fight and keeping combat in flow. And the brawling as well is something that we wanted to feel very visceral, very fast paced. Uh, how have we achieved that? Yeah, well, and a, a keyword is immersive. So um, the control scheme is, is quite intuitive. I uh, really love that pulling the triggers is feed because that's like two fangs sinking them in. But yeah, the basic sort of actions that Fire has, she can you know, punch, she can do a heavy strike, which allows her to knock people back, which is very useful for the Bruja, they can use it to sort of juggle enemies. If they're overwhelmed, they can go back and get away, enemies away from them. The defensive move uh, she has is dashing, which you'll have seen in the, in, there's one point in the gameplay where if you dash towards an enemy as they strike and you time it right, it counters it. Uh, but then Fire also has um, telekinesis, 
which isn't usual for a vampire to have. Uh, but there's a story behind that, and specifically why el- uh, fire uh, as an elder has it. But yes, it, when stalking, you know, use telekinesis to pick up a bottle, distract an enemy, but you can use it to literally pull the enemies towards you. So you can use heavy strikes to push away and telekinesis to pull towards you, giving you a lot of control over the enemies and how you're encountering them. So that Bruja very much wants to control the sort of dance of combat. So the mannequins work a little differently from the other enemies that we saw. Could you tell us about those illusions? Sure, I mean, everything that we saw really is an illusion from when Willem first screamed at the, at the player. Um, but the initial enemies do fight more like typical enemies. The only thing that's different about them is the fact that they shatter to sort of glass when they're killed. But as we get deeper into Willem's sort of maze, essentially, his, his powers are getting weaker, he's getting more desperate. So the, in the first phase, he's able to create believable, uh, they're ghouls and vampires that we're fighting there. So the ones with a beating heart, they're ghouls, and the ones that are just black silhouettes, they are vampires. Whereas when we move to the mannequins, um, he isn't able to create illusions of such uh, quality, and he's also getting desperate. And what better to fight a vampire with than an enemy that has no blood? So the mannequins are made of solid wood. So you notice in the playthrough there, um, we're being very tactical about our abilities because we have no way to recharge them. We can't get the blood back. Um, so yeah, there's a really cool moment where uh, kites a load of them up onto the gangway up above and then charges through and gets maximum effect. And this was to create a sort of peak combat challenge for that mission because while we're sh- what we've shown there, that sort of 15 minutes, that's the end of the mission. The player has actually been across Seattle, you know, going other places. So we wanted to give a peak and the actual Willem encounter itself, which is after, is more cerebral. So we wanted to peak the combat so then you could shift to this more cerebral uh, sort of puzzle boss encounter with Willem trying to you know, de- defeat his illusions. So yeah, they, they're a very unique enemy in the game. They only occur there in the game and they have that unique mechanic of they cannot be fed on, which makes, you know, really uh, changes up the pace of how you play. So the three abilities that we saw include the kind of active ones and then the rewards for the feeding. How do they all play into each other and the combat and how do you use them? Yeah, so for that that video we've equipped two of the Bruja uh, abilities. There are more abilities, uh, but we just wanted to show off those two. And then we have the passive, which you get when you select the clan. So each clan has their own feed passive. So every single time they feed, they get some benefit that reflects their clan's playstyle. So the Bruja, we call it sort of a berserk mode. They they get flushed with sort of aggression. Their arms literally grow, uh, glow. Their strikes do more damage and more knockback and things like that. So you'll notice points where um, even though uh, you know, we feed on people, maybe you'll see the feed flash up on another person, but we've already committed to the strike and we're doing more damage, so we kill them. So feeding actually is another sort of skillful reward. It's another part of the dance that's very important. As a Bruja, I suppose there's a role-playing element there, right? Because they are passionate, maybe have a bit of a temper, and that's why we picked the intimidating options here. So I was wondering what kind of role play opportunities that gives us in in the dialogues. Yeah, so picking intimidating options, the result very much depends on who you're talking to. I mean, there are certain characters, say like Lou, who will, you know, meet fire with fire. Right? They will equally become as angry. But that can be a good way to find out what they're hiding, right? Provoke them and get them to, to talk. There are others who could clam up. Tolly would probably laugh at you and dismiss it and sort of see through the bravado. But ultimately, it will affect your relationships with them over the long term. They'll get a feel for you. And also the relationship with Fabian. So Fabian is a, a vampire who is in our head for mysterious reasons. They're with us for the whole whole ride. And they are meeting, you know, judging uh, you and fire based on what you're choosing. So if you're very aggressive all of the time, that's who you are to them. That's the nearest thing we have in the game to like a true 
you know, single judgment of who you were as a player is, is Fabian. Whereas other characters, you might behave differently to each other, put on different masks, because it is the masquerade. Different masks of how you talk, talk and interact with each of them. Vampires rarely show their true selves, so it's totally viable for the player, if they wish to hide their true selves as well. The supernatural heightened senses give us clues to solve this puzzle that only a vampire can solve. What sort of puzzles can we expect? You know, heightened senses is based on sort of ore specs in the, in the pen and paper. But we like the idea that, that far almost as an elder can access it whenever she likes. So we can use heightened senses to show you things that others couldn't see, you know, almost, um, uh, like sort of CSI, <laughs> you know, black light or whatever, clues uh, to hear things, you know, in focus in the mission, she could hear the music from greater distance when in heightened senses than she could otherwise. Uh, and in the, the maze at the end, it dulled out the fake noise, all of the Willems chattering to each other, they all got dulled out. And in the real noise, which was the music in the real world, she could hear, so it can help you in a situation like that, actually see and hear reality. Um, but yes, in other sections of the game, it can help you to see what a human would would miss, right? Follow someone's trail, get evidence of what's happened there. Um, and there are, yeah, there's quite a few interesting puzzles that we've done across the games using high senses. And I think this mission is a great example of a slightly more unusual version of our art direction in the lighting, the music, the style overall. There's books floating around. I think we punch one at one point. What kind of feeling do we want to kind of pump into that atmosphere? Yeah, I mean, at this section of the game, we sort of call it the, the monster of the week section of the, of, of the game. We want the missions to very much stand out before it becomes clear they're make, you know, becoming part of a larger picture. But that, you, you can't trust uh, even your own senses, right? Um, you know, up is down, um, red is blue. Uh, <laughs> just making it so the player is, is really on edge and not knowing what's going on. And I hope when people come to play, because obviously watching it, you're watching someone play through who still roughly knows what they're doing for the sake of the video. I'm hoping, you know, people are in there really sort of scratching their head, using their heightened senses, and then feeling clever when they figure out how to move forward, how to get out of there, how to get out of Willem's maze. And we spent a lot of time talking to and learning about Willem. Could you go into a little bit about his place in the court and the masquerade? Yeah, so Willem is the secret keeper of the court. Um, but at this point in the story, he's gone AWOL along with the secrets. So the court is in complete control of Seattle, right? The mayor is probably one of the court's ghouls, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They've got dirt on all the people uh, in the city, including other vampires. And to stop uh, all of that um, information getting in the wrong hands, there's this role, which is the sort of secret keeper. But they keep it all memorized. Willem has all of the information effectively me memorized. So when he disappears, their sort of ability to keep control over the city gets massively weakened. Um, so hence it's so important that he be found, but also some of the secrets he has are very relevant to Fire, so she wants to find him. As part of the court, Fire has found a place and is doing missions for the Camarilla. Could you tell us about like her title and what capacity she's doing these, these things? Yes, yeah, so relatively early in the, in the story, Fire has to get an inroads with the Camarilla and she does a mission which ultimately results in her becoming the sheriff which is an official role within the court and it's pretty cool I don't think we've got to play that uh, in other video games at least and the sheriff ultimately upholds the masquerade and will do you know certain quite important maybe dirty jobs like finding the secret keeper who's who's run off but it also gives fire great privilege as the sheriff, she, she 
can talk to anyone and everyone kind of has to give her respect should <laughs> should sort of follow along with the letter of the law and obey her obviously we have different factions in the city some who respect the camarilla some who don't so she will get she will get some reacting in her favor because she's seraph and some actually where it's become more a hindrance but yeah so she's a, a very pivotal role uh, in the seattle court and that's very much for her own means once it gets her the the cover and support of the Camarilla, they're not going to be you know, fighting and working against her, but two, it puts her in the perfect position to investigate the information she wants to know, which is how she ended up in Seattle and how she ended up with the mark on and her abilities taken away. We had some dialogue options that kind of fed into Fire's legend. Could you tell us about what kind of control we have over her backstory? Yes, yeah, so you're going to come across you know, lots of different you know, vampires and characters who ha haven't met Fire, but they've heard of Fire. She's very famous, effectively a legend. The Nomad, uh, right? In the Nomad and other names. Um, and then as a player, when someone tells you one of these legends they've heard about you, you could you know, validate it and lean into it. Fire very much uses it there to intimidate uh, Willem. You could correct them that it isn't true if you feel that doesn't either fit your character or because you maybe wish to manipulate your legend. Because Fire is never saying what her backstory is, everybody else is, the player can then choose the true canon of Fire by accepting what they're hearing, essentially. So we thought it was a cool way to find to have a you know a more defined character, you know, like you would say in a Bioware game, but not just the I pick this the backstory at the start and that's it. Have as you go, being able to pick and choose and shape your legend. Awesome. And we will be sharing as much as we can about the new disciplines that you can see for each playable clan. If you want to see as much as possible about Bloodlines 2 and the stuff that we're sharing, you can find us at the Chinese Room on all of our social media. But until next time, thank you. Thank you.